From the studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And welcome back once more. Pleased that you came back for another episode of the Cannabis Podcast. And if this is your first time, well, welcome. I hope you find the information useful. We're going to spend the next 30 minutes or so talking about a whole bunch of cannabis information that has come up over this past week. Last time, we talked about the fact that a woman had tried to cross the border with some CBD oil and had received a lifetime ban, information which I was told about both by my brother and sister-in-law. And I want to again thank my sister-in-law for a follow-up on that. We will touch on that. Apparently, that decision was reversed. We'll give a bit of those details. Some interesting stories as well that came out this week. Did you know that when you're smoking from a pipe or a bong, it could be dirtier than a toilet seat? (laughs) Doesn't really sound appealing, does it? We'll chat on that. That is a story coming up from High Times. Actually, a couple from High Times this week. And another study, we've all heard the discussion about adolescents consuming marijuana or cannabis, and I'm not suggesting that any adolescent should. Wait until you're old enough to do that. 18, 19, whatever the, the age is in your particular province. But a new study has found that there may not be the link between adolescent weed use and adult brain structure, as many have claimed in the past. We'll take a touch on that as well. And this is a story that I think is going to be bursting forth more, and you'll understand the pun in a moment, (laughs) in the coming few years. I've heard about this in a couple of locations in British Columbia now, but we're going to talk about one where there is going to be a cannabis exhibition at their fall fair. So there's the best pumpkin, there's the best zucchini, and now there's going to be the best cannabis. Now, this is a wonderful time to live in Canada. All of that and more is coming your way on episode 28 of the Cannabis Podcast. From studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. So first of all, let's touch on that reversal that happened, because we, of course, talked about it in the last episode. And that was the fact that a woman had gone into the United States had been asked if she was carrying any leafy green materials, had responded no, they had found some CBD oil, and then they completely reversed, or rather then they gave her a lifetime ban for crossing into the United States. Now, this is a story that I'm quoting from cbc.ca. The link, of course, as always, is found back at cannabispodcast.com for all the things I'm going to be talking about today. The U.S. has reversed a lifetime ban on a Canadian woman who crossed the border with CBD oil. In fact, it was less than two weeks ago that a Canadian woman was barred from entering the United States after she was found with cannabidiol oil at the border. Her lifetime ban from entering the States has been reversed in what her lawyer is calling a best-case scenario. The 21-year-old, who was asked not to be identified, was crossing the border between B.C. and Washington State last month when CBD oil was found in her backpack, which we talked about before. Now, as we've also talked about before many, many times, CBD is a non-psychoactive product of the cannabis plant, The woman says she uses it to treat the painful side effects of scoliosis. She says she thought it was okay for the oil to be carried over the border, considering such products are legal in both British Columbia and Washington. But of course, while some states have dismantled prohibition, cannabis possession remains a criminal offense federally in the United States, and the U.S. border is governed by federal law. So the woman, an undergraduate student at the University of Guelph in Ontario, was fined $500 for failing to declare the oil, fingerprinted, and subsequently denied entry into the U.S. She was told if she ever hoped to regain entry, she would have to pay an additional $585 to apply for a special waiver. That's a document required for all people denied admission after deportation or removal. Well, her lawyer, Len Saunders, who had been working with the woman to fill out that application, said his client was unexpectedly contacted by a supervisor at the Point Roberts, Washington point of entry on Friday and told her inadmissibility case had been reversed and she would no longer be required to apply for the waiver. To quote the lawyer, my reaction obviously was shock. I was shocked that it was such a 180-degree turn from basically being barred for life to being told that they had, on their own, reversed the case, and it basically reversed their decision, said Saunders, who is based in the border city of Blaine, Washington. The port of entry did not provide the woman or Saunders a reason for the reversal. So there you go. Sometimes you never know what's going to happen with all of these various cases. Nice to see that that did get reversed, that she no longer faces a lifetime ban for entering the United States. Of course, the warning is always, and anytime anybody asks me about traveling with any bits of cannabis, 
Uh, whether they are crossing an international border, of course, don't try it. Why would you even try to take anything across an international border in this day and age, since federally the United States is so still against cannabis? But there you go, a happy ending for the woman who had been banned for life from the United States. And for whatever reason, which nobody can quite understand, that decision has now been reversed. Okay, do you smoke out of a bong? Maybe you use a pipe. <laughs> you may want to sit down for this next story. Because, well, this, I guess, isn't really a big surprise. This is a story I pulled out of HighTimes.com this last week. And it's a little shocking <laughs> to think how we have all been putting ourselves in uh, rather a precarious situation. <laughs> a study finds smoking from a pipe can expose you to more germs than a toilet seat. Now, let's face it, we touch a lot of dirty things every day. Dirty items inside the house include bathroom hand towels and dog toys. Outside of the house, well, everything from shopping carts to ATMs can expose us to high concentrations of germs. And that doesn't even cover everyday items like cell phones, cash, and computer keyboards, all of which have high germ exposure potential. Well, the same can be said for items that go in our mouths, like fingernails and pens, sharing drinks, Toothbrushes and food can also spell out Germ City. And that bizarre five-second rule? Forget about it. Germs are everywhere. They're unavoidable, but don't freak out. They're a totally normal part of living, and your immune system will protect you from most of them. However, there's a pressing germ concern unique to the cannabis community. Group consumption of pipes and joints. And for those of us who have been imbibing for a number of years... This has been going on for the same number of years. I can't even begin to think or count the number of joints I might have passed over the last 40 years. It would add up to a whole lot. <laughs> and again, the information that I'm relating to is found back in the link to it is found back at CannabisPodcast.com. A recent study conducted by Los Angeles-based Moose Labs found that cannabis pipes, vapes, and joints all have an astounding level of bacteria. It went on to state that it was difficult to find a neutral everyday item that matched its level of bacteria. The analysis produced significantly higher than expected results. In all, the average cannabis pipe was found to have almost one and a half times more bacteria than a public toilet seat. The report concluded that each person should use a mouthpiece when consuming, although I can't quite figure out how that would work with a joint. The findings support using a product like a disposable or washable mouthpiece with a filter like one that Moose Labs offers. This is a point that the company's co-founder, Jay Rush, said the study sought out to prove. It really is just absolutely horrifying, Rush said about the findings. I almost feel bad telling people, but would you rather be informed and upset or uninformed and blissfully ignorant? Other experts in the field told High Times they recommended carrying a product like alcohol wipes when smoking a bong or a pipe with a large group of people. Christopher Karuba, MD, explained why cannabis consumption devices can become so contaminated. He cited biofilm formation as the cause. Marijuana itself can be a host to numerous bacterial and fungal organisms, and contaminated bong water can similarly serve as a host for bacteria, candida, and other types of fungi, he said. As these organisms grow, they secrete substances that allow them to cling to certain physical objects such as plastic, or glass within a bong. The accumulation of these secretions leads to the formation of a biofilm that serves to protect these organisms and to facilitate their ongoing proliferation. Dr. Karuba went on to note that biofilms are resistant to standard cleaning solutions and antimicrobial agents. Once a biofilm forms, bacterial and fungal contaminants may persist even after a basic washing of the bong. He added that some of the more common microbial organisms and their potential risks include aspergillosis. When burned, the fungal organism aspergillosis releases microtoxins that can gather in bong water and be inhaled later on. This can potentially cause a cough or chest pain and can lead to pulmonary disease. Pseudomonas. This bacterial organism can cause acute pneumonia and sepsis. It's difficult to treat often requiring antimicrobial therapy for long periods. Flavobacterium. This bacteria is found in sources of stagnant water like an unclean bong. An infection can lead to pulmonary symptoms and diarrhea. Streptococcus species. 
The common bacteria usually found in the skin and in the oral and respiratory tract. It's responsible for infections such as strep throat, pneumonia, ear infections, and other unpleasant medical results. E. coli. We always hear about E. coli. Well, it can also be found in the cannabis plant as well as human and animal feces. Exposure to E. coli can turn into symptoms including diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. The Moose Lab study focuses on cannabis pipes as the company did not receive enough materials to analyze joints and vaporizers as closely as the pipes. However, Rush noted that the unnamed joints and vaporizer provided in the test are products he uses personally. I consider myself a relatively clean person, Rush said, and they both read significantly higher than anything else that we have tested for. So that may not make you feel really good about smoking out of your pipe with a group of people. Perhaps it's time to do some cleaning. I always use some uh, fairly high, 90% or higher of isopropyl alcohol to clean all of my glass devices. And that seems to do a pretty good job. So I like to think they're running fairly cleanly. So the next time that you are in a party situation and you're passing around such a device, just keep that in mind. Maybe don't hold your lips on it quite so long. And maybe you can avoid some of the germs that are on that. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. <laughs> This is the Cannabis Podcast. I was not surprised to see this information as looking at various media outlets and stories over this past week. Ever since we started this podcast, and b before I carry on, let me just actually offer a bit of an apology. If you can hear an exceptional amount of rumbling going on underneath what's happening in, as I'm talking today, it's because there is a significant amount of rumbling. Now, I obviously do some, do some processing of this before I put it out as a podcast. And if some of that still sneaks through, my apologies for it. Our street is being dug up and completely replaced. So there's a lot of heavy equipment out front right now. And despite the studio, uh, some of that is leaking through the ground is where most of that rumble is coming from. So my apologies for that. Back to what I was talking about. When we first started this podcast, we've been talking about you know, all the different cannabis cultures across our country. I have, obviously, because I'm in BC, concentrated a lot on BC. But we chatted as well about some of the other provinces, and one especially, Quebec, and how it was very clear right from the beginning that they really did not want cannabis to succeed in their province. Because it was allocated federally, they had no choice, and they had to you know, set up their stores, but it clearly was done with a lot of reluctance. And the story this week kind of emphasized that that reluctance is still there. The heading, and this is a story from leafly.ca. Once again, all the contacts and all the links to them back at cannabispodcast.com. Also remember, if you ever have any comments you'd like to tell me about, info at cannabispodcast.com is an excellent way to communicate. Quebec doesn't want cannabis-infused beverages to taste too good. After the CAQ government presented a bill in July seeking to restrict ingestible cannabis products from the provincial market, Quebec's public health directors have just put forward recommendations to impose further restrictions to protect minors and prevent new users. Ingestible cannabis will become legal in the rest of Canada come October, with products likely hitting store shelves by December, people are hoping. In a public paper released on, Oct on August 26, the province's 18 public health directors presented their own recommendations to the CAQ government regarding the ban on ingestible cannabis to eliminate gray areas that could allow certain types of sweetened beverages and juices to be sold in Quebec. In the document, it specified that their recommendations are about curbing the risk that the number of users of cannabis increases and that current users do not begin to consume more as a result of these new products. And that's the really interesting paragraph from my perspective. It is absolutely clear they really don't want people to consume cannabis. They certainly don't want you to consume more than you do today. And they do not want to see any new users come into the cannabis world. That's the attitude in Quebec, quite obviously. Citing statistical information from American states where cannabis was legalized, the directors highlighted that sweetened beverages that mask the taste of cannabis could easily lead to consumers consuming too much of the product because of the delayed and difficult to anticipate effect of ingestible cannabis. They also fear that the beverages would lead to accidental consumption by youth, resulting in dangerous consequences and hospitalizations. Now, I totally understand that point. We should always be concerned about the safety of our youth. 
Instead, they suggested that any cannabis beverage be recognizable by the taste of cannabis, so that they are distinguishable from mainstream foods. The 18 directors also want to see fewer products available at the SQDC outlets, as they believe that having so many varieties of products is too attractive to consumers and will only result in greater consumption and entice new users. <gasps> entice new users? <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. Instead, they are asking that an independent government committee be formed to regulate and help diminish the amount of products sold in Quebec before they even make it to the SQDC. However, Quebec has yet to respond to the paper stating that government requires an additional 40 days to study the document. According to Jennifer Larry, founder and president of CBD Strategy Group, it is incredibly frustrating from a commercial standpoint to think that businesses would need to pivot or omit a region after having jumped through so many hurdles to adapt to Canadian government standards. Larry, whose organization helps cannabis brands to create commercial marketing, brand strategy, and business development within the context of Canada's Cannabis Act, sees both sides of the coin. Though legalization was meant to regulate cannabis, making it an accepted, quality-assured, taxable good with strong safety restrictions, particularly where minors are concerned, Larry sees Quebec as taking this literally, in every sense of the way. Part of this, she explains, was due to a language barrier. Larry, who is an Anglophone from Quebec, said there's a tremendous amount of information that did not make its way into the French language, and as a result, Quebecers were denied the opportunity to be less afraid of cannabis see it destigmatized, or learn about its scientific potential. She does not, however, see Quebec's regulations as something to be upset over, because it will fundamentally ensure quality control and product confidence at a time when the industry is really in its infancy. So once more, we clearly see demonstrated in Quebec that they do not want current cannabis consumers to consume more, and heaven forbid that they actually get some new users of cannabis in the province. Oh, that is clearly something that they do not want to see. And people wonder whether legalization still has some issues. <laughs> I think legalization may still have some issues in some of the provinces in our country. Now, here's another interesting article from High Times that popped up this week. We've long heard about the concern and a valid concern. We don't want people consuming cannabis too young. Understand that. That's why we have legal ages all across our country, varying from 18 to 19. Maybe a province or two. No, I think that's 18 or 19. 21, perhaps. But regardless of that, there has long been a discussion that marijuana use in teens and adolescents can significantly impact the brain structure as it develops, since, of course, it hasn't completed developing until you're in your mid-20s thereabouts. Well, a study has now found no link between adolescent weed use and adult brain structure. The study is groundbreaking and will hopefully help break the stigma of cannabis use. And this is a story from High Times. Concerns surrounding marijuana use among adolescents have long been a hurdle for legalization advocates, given that the brains of children are developing at a rapid rate. But a new study suggests that cannabis may not pose much long-term risk on brain function at all. The study to be published in next month's issue of Drug and Alcohol Dependence and conducted by researchers at Arizona State University, tested associations between prospectively assessed trajectories of adolescent cannabis use and adult brain structure in a sample of boys followed to adulthood. In an effort to test the hypothesis that adolescent marijuana users demonstrate structural alterations to their brains in adulthood, the researchers analyzed self-reported cannabis use among boys aged 13 to 19 in Pittsburgh. The group of around 1,000 boys was examined during the 1980s. When certain adolescent cannabis trajectories were identified by the researchers, the boys were classified based on four different trajectories. Non-users, infrequent users, desisters, escalators, and chronic relatively frequent users. Boys in different trajectory subgroups did not differ on adult brain structure in any subcortical or cortical region of interest, the researchers wrote in their analysis of the results. Additionally, there was a subset of 181 of the boys, which subsequently underwent structural neuroimaging in adulthood when they were between the ages of 30 and 36, 
That subset was then tested to identify any differences in adult brain structure. In conclusion, the researcher said that adolescent cannabis use is not associated with structural brain differences in adulthood. In conclusion, the researcher said that adolescent cannabis use is not associated with structural brain differences in adulthood. They added, even boys with the highest level of cannabis exposure in adolescence showed subcortical brain volumes and cortical brain volumes and thickness in adulthood that were similar to boys with almost no exposure to cannabis throughout adolescence. The research, which was led by Madeline Meyer, the director of Arizona State University's Substance Use, Health, and Behavior Lab, is just the latest in a slew of recent studies that analyze the long-term effects of cannabis use. As legalization spreads across America and throughout the world, like Canada, the calls for sound, academic research on pot use, which has long been lacking, have intensified. In that same spirit, a study last month examined why marijuana makes some users anxious while others experience joy and euphoria. And that is a whole different discussion. <laughs> So there you go, another study indicating that perhaps there isn't this strong link between cannabis use as an adolescent and different brain structure as an adult. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And finish off with some fun. This is a story that I think we are going to hear more and more about, especially as if, as has been discussed, there is more of a cottage industry for growing that opens up in our country as co-ops start to develop and get legal licenses to produce. This may become more of an issue in the future. And what I'm talking about is fall fairs. Now, here in British Columbia, there is a plethora of fall fairs that occur every year. And I know that there are now two, at least, one that I'm going to be talking about in this story, which is a story from Vancouver Island uh, CTV News. And that's referring to a location on Vancouver Island, but I also know it's happening at the Grand Forks Fall Fair. They are going to have a cannabis exhibit, so the best pumpkin, the best zucchini, and the best cannabis, which is fantastic. This really shows that Canada is changing and we are growing up, that we are, at least many of us, are realizing that the stigma has to go away and we need to celebrate the benefits of this plant more and more. So here is the story from uh, Vancouver Island CTV News. It's been legalized and it's agriculture. Farming exhibition to crown best in show for craft cannabis. In the 150 plus year history of a Vancouver Island agricultural exhibition, farmers have put their best berries, pies, and even cookies to the test. But this year, something a little more pungent is entering the ring. For the first time ever, a team of judges at the Cowichan Agricultural Exhibition and Fair will crown the very best in craft cannabis. It's been legalized and it's agriculture, said Exhibition Executive Director Sherry Patterson. It's something that hasn't really been done anywhere else, at least to our knowledge. Organizers say in an effort to attract new attention to the farming exhibition, a category for homegrown cannabis was added. Other competitions include best homemade jam, largest cookie, and finest fruits. Lots of competition here, People get pretty involved in it and want to win one of those blue ribbons, Patterson told CTV Vancouver Island. Exhibition staff say similar agricultural competitions have been held in the United Kingdom and the Duncan Area competition is being modeled after them. Even under the umbrella of legalization, judges will not be smoking any BC bud. Well, that's a bit of a disappointment. <laughs> Certainly would be if I was entering in the, con in the contest. A winner will be crowned after judges analyze the aroma, texture, and color of the different strains of cannabis without actually trying the cannabis. Do they not taste the pies in a pie competition? Do they not taste the bread in a bread competition? I'm just asking questions. I don't know the answers to those questions. So far, the competition has received 17 entries. The winner of the best homegrown cannabis competition won't get any extra cash for munchies. The competition is only for bragging rights and, of course, that coveted blue ribbon. The Cowichan Exhibition and Fair has been held for 151 years, and this their first year where they are having a craft cannabis competition. And that shows that we truly are growing up as a country. <laughs> and I'm pretty excited about that. I think that is very, very cool news. 
I'm looking for suggestions. I'm looking for suggestions specifically on cultivars. What cultivars do you think in the legal market here in Canada would be worth having a listen to, having a look at, having a, having a taste of? <laughs> I'll be the one tasting it. You'll be the one hearing about it. But I'd really like to concentrate on some cultivars that have some interest to people across the country. And I know there are listeners right across the country. Thank you all for letting me know that you're out there and that you're enjoying what we're doing here on the Cannabis Podcast. I'm having a blast doing it. It's just a hoot. Gives me an opportunity and a, and a purpose to get high during the day <laughs> and have some fun with relaying some information. So if you ever have anything that you would like to pass along, or you have a cultivar that you think would be fabulous to look at at Cultivar Corner, send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. And we will review all the information that we get and make some judgments about what's coming up in the future. I had promised that we were going to do another cultivar this week, but I did not get a chance to get out and find a really interesting one. So that's why I'm seeking some advice. Give me some things to look at so that I'll have a better perspective when I go looking for a new cultivar. There really hasn't been any further changes in the retail market here in the Okanagan. We're still a single store here in Kelowna. There's a couple stores in Penticton. Going to try and give one of them a call, see how things are going down there, perhaps in the next episode, see what's happening with that. And there's still a couple of stores in Vernon, and we're waiting for more stores to open here in the Okanagan and see how the retail landscape continues to change. It's still, I still have to say, as we are now heading into a federal election, and for those of you who are not in Canada, that means for the next 40 days, uh, all of our various political parties are going to be saying nasty things about each other. And uh, Justin Trudeau, who is our prime minister, is likely to take a lot of the, that heat. But we do also have to recognize that it was the Liberal Party that made cannabis legal in our country. And even though there may be significant problems, <laughs> and there are, but we have achieved at least the fact that we can go out in our backyard smoke a joint and not have to worry about anybody because cannabis is legal in this country. So interesting to see what happens in our federal election. That's coming up October 21st. So the next 31 days or 39 days, we're going to be <laughs> bombarded with political advertisements. So I'll try to ignore most of those. I know what I'll do. I'll just get high. And that way it's a lot easier to listen to the political announcements and to be able to cipher through to the actual details of what we want to talk about. So give me those suggestions. We will find another cultivar to talk about next week. And of course, there is always lots and lots of cannabis stories that are developing all around the world. We'll try to feature a few of those and gather them all up when we gather next time. That wraps it up for episode 28 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Cannabis Podcast.